Good afternoon. Are we on? OK, good afternoon and welcome to uh, the kickoff meeting. Can I have the first slide, please? Uh, to the uh, updating of Chapter 217. Uh, your speakers today are going to be Paul Brochi, uh, Lewis Heron, Beldasar Ramirez. We're engineers in the Water Quality Division, and we're going to be talking about uh, for possible changes to Chapter 217. Uh, the timeline is we have the kickoff meeting today. Uh, we're going to ask at the end of this meeting, we're going to talk about other things, but we're going to ask for comments and proposed changes that you would like to see and to submit that to us no later than no, uh, pardon me, January 15th. Um, and just to let you know, we're, we rewrote the design criteria, adopted it back in 2008 with the idea of updating it every five years. And since the last one was updated in 2015, it is time to start doing it because uh, the technology, like I said, technology keeps changing uh, and standards keep getting tighter. But uh, getting back to our timeline that we're looking at, and I will tell you this timeline is subject to change and it probably will change uh, due to COVID and due to the legislative session that we're about to enter. Uh, after we get your comments, we're going to draft a memo a memo to our executive director and our commissioners asking for permission to uh, proceed with the rule changes and that's going to be done somewhere in February. We will start our revisions and holding uh, stakeholder meetings on certain sections of the rules and these meetings are going to be set up uh, on specific issues like UV, uh, MBRs, filters, uh, on different things and uh, we'll invite manufacturers and engineers to participate and these things will be set up on our uh, on our website so you know and the meetings will be open to everyone so but they will be open and hopefully somewhere in the future we will be able to uh, uh, meet in person instead of uh, virtual as we're in uh somewhere in july we will be drafting the rule with the preamble and fiscal note and hopefully sometime in august we'll be going for the commission to uh permission to publish in the texas register if everything goes right we will have a public hearing on the draft rules in october and we're looking for adoption probably somewhere in march of 2022. i know this is ambitious but it also looks like it's far in the future um there are several proposed changes and we may not make any changes just depending on how everything works out but this is what we're looking at right now and uh and go uh one of the things i did not you guys are talking but no sound that's what i just saw pop up am i not speaking across the are y'all hearing me i was is anybody else not hearing me I need a comment uh, if somebody's hearing or not hearing me. In the Q&A section, just. In the Q&A section, please type in, yes, I hear you or no, I don't hear. Well, if you don't hear me. You can hear. It's just... Okay, then I, I guess Mr. Manning, other people are hearing me fine. Okay. Anyway, uh, what I was getting ready to say is uh, this presentation is uh, going to happen and there may be some delay in um, our, our answering your questions. But if you have questions at any time, instead of waiting to the end of this presentation, write your questions in the uh, live Q&A or question and answer session and we'll try to answer them as soon as we get your uh, question. Nancy uh, is going to be reading the questions out so we can uh, uh, answer your questions. As I said, I have Paul, myself, and Beldasar here. 
we'll try to answer all your questions up front. So, but getting back to it is we're on a short uh, line timeline to get these rules adopted. Uh, we're going to be talking about things that we have seen in the past that have either confused people, uh, have caused other people problems, or have interpretation problems or people are request us to uh, look at for changes. And we'll be talking about that in the future. Uh, next slide. And just to give you, most of y'all have seen this slide. I've used it for many times. Uh, the history of the design criteria in Texas. The first codified uh, rules were adopted on uh, uh, September 18th, uh, 1950. Before then, they were basically written into guidelines uh, for different types of treatment units. And you can see the major revisions were in 61, 68, 70, 74, 81, 90, uh, 2008, and 2015. There were minor revisions throughout this time period, but these are the dates of the major revisions. Uh, next slide. And uh, Paul will be speaking for now. And I need to slow down. Uh, good afternoon. Um, like it says, what I'm going to be speaking on first is the the emergency power requirements uh, that's listed in 217. Uh, currently, you know, we do require emergency power for treatment, uh, at least partial treatment and lift stations so that we can um, keep things moving well. Uh, I think if we're what we're going to be doing with the power requirements is mainly just looking to see if there uh, is uh, some minor correctional stuff that we need or do we if we need to enhance it to uh, increase some of the uh, some of the treatment units. I know uh, there's been a, a movement for a lot of uh, ultraviolet treatment instead of just um, chemical disinfection. So that takes a lot more power and we're going to look at uh, making sure that there is emergency power for uh, ultraviolet uh, disinfection. Um, the general in general, the power requirements are going to depend on the type of treatment systems that are that are involved. Uh, the filters, you're going to definitely need uh, pumping. Uh, power uh, emergency power for pumping to make sure that at least partial treatment is in. Uh, definitely we want to make sure that we keep things moving. Uh, what we want to see what we can possibly do for uh, aeration systems in activated sludge. Uh, can we limit how much power that is required there? And then like it says, we, we just want to keep things moving. We want to uh, we want to make sure that there's no septic conditions and we want to make sure that uh, at least partial treatment is going on and get as much treatment as we can for um, the power requirements that we got. Uh, definitely we need to make sure that critical units have um, have a emergency power so that uh, the treatment is there. We've got um, definitely we want to make sure that disinfection and aeration are are there for lift stations. The requirements are still going to be there that we have emergency power. Um, we may have to look at the uh, portable generator versus fixed generator at lift station sites, depending on the sizing of the lift stations. We are going to have to look at um, and we'll see some more uh, lift station issues in the collection systems. But um, like I said, emergency power is mainly used to make sure that we don't have any unauthorized discharges occurring during uh, conditions of power outages. We, when we want to make sure that flow and treatment are, are all occurring at least to some degree. Next slide, please. And now I'll get into the collection systems. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And I believe there is only one slide in this. Uh, for collection systems, 
if there's questions, ask questions after each session. Yeah, uh, that's one, one thing I forgot to say. If you, if you have questions on anything, please ask them after the uh, the section. I see we have a question for emergency power requirements for um, waste activated sludge pumps. Um, that is something that we will take into consideration at this time. We're not prepared to uh, say yes or no as to whether we're going to require that or not. Uh, any other questions on the emergency power requirements? Um, I know there may be a lag, so we'll um, so we'll start and if if more come in, we'll we'll handle them either at the end of the the overall presentation or we may take a break to go ahead and answer questions in the middle. So now moving ahead to the collection systems, I, I know one of the things that we've had a big push for recently is some new pipe technologies that have come about. Um, we have had some uh, vendors pipe vendors with different pipes come up and and present their materials to us. So there's a possibility that we will incorporate new pipe technologies within 217 and go forward from there. Um, same with force mains as to whether we're going to uh, we're going to review the force mains. We're going to we'll, we'll review the pressure requirements. I know there was um, some discussions that we had a, a few weeks ago with with one entity that um, basically do we need a 160 psi force main or 50 percent over 50 psi over working pressure for um, the pipes if the uh, pressure that's in the force main is only a given thing um, and if the pipe is strong enough to to handle the PSI rating that's there, why do we have to go up to 150 PSI? So that is one thing that we're going to look at. Um, there. You have a question? You want me to read it for you? Yeah, please, Nancy. Will there be recommended peaking factor for design of the sewer lines in 217.53 pipe design? I believe uh, we will keep the peaking factors as we have them now. I don't see us changing them. There is a possibility. And um, if there's a compelling argument that we uh, can review and make sure that all the uh, safety factors are involved and because that's mainly what it comes down to is uh, the safety of the, the lines and the public and the environment. If that can all be taken into account, then there's a possibility that maybe we'll change the peaking factors. Okay. The next question, can laser profiling be an acceptable <clears throat> alternate to mandrel testing? For large pipes, for large pipes yes. Uh, for standard size pipes or smaller pipes, no, we still want to have the mandrels pulled. Okay. See. I believe it's it's the same question here again. That's all the questions I have. Okay. Uh, what I'll do is then I'll move on into the lift stations. Um, one thing we will we do want to review is the required active volume of lift stations and how emergency storage is handled in lift stations. We don't want to surcharge the lines to um, make any issues with uh, possible unauthorized discharge or backflow into people's houses. So um, that is one thing that uh, we want to make sure that there is enough storage so that that doesn't occur and still be able to handle the emergency storage for wastewater that can occur during power outages. I know all bets are off when we we get uh, act of God and stuff like that coming down. So 
I mean, we'll we'll handle that. Um, other than other than that, what um, basic what we will look at, we'll review the whole collection system chapters, um, the two sub chapters, and you know there's probably some editorial um, changes and corrections that will be needed. So we will go into that and um, and do that. Uh, the one thing we do not plan on changing is the se required separation distances and the sections that detail the nine feet and the diagonal um, and everything like that. So we're going to keep the separation distances the same. Uh, no question. No. OK, let's go to the next slide. Well, we do have a question. Now. Oh, yes. We don't want so much storage in lift station that we call septic conditions. Correct. This is true. Uh, we will, like I said, it, it's it's a given. It's a give and take and a balancing act, and um, we will design 217 and update 217 as needed to stay within the balance and make sure that septic conditions aren't aren't occurring within the lift stations. Okay, one more. Will any of these rules be retroactive to older lift stations? No, they won't. Um, anything that was built under the existing 217 or earlier versions will still be valid. Uh, it'll be six months after, I think, is Normal. usually what it is. Normally, it's there's a six month grace period uh, from the time it's published to when you have to definitely start moving over into the new conditions. So um, that'll be taken into account. Will max pipe pressure rating consider surge protection? That is an interesting question that I don't know that we're prepared to answer right now, uh, but it is something that we will take under consideration. And I see there's a question on what editorial corrections are expected. Like I said, we're just going to review, once we open the rule, that we may as well review um, any and all possibilities of it uh, within and anything within the rule and see if there there's corrections that need to be made uh, at this point. It's basically more clarification than it will be changes. So uh, at this point we, we can't tell we can't specifically state what editorial corrections will be made. That was more of a catch all to correct some miswording or update wording in terms of what's currently in the rule. We have one more. Mm -hmm. Current guidance indicates pump must run continuously during cycle time. Industry typically defines pump cycle time as pump on to pump on or pump off to pump off which includes the time the pump is not running. Uh, I'm not sure. No. We, look that. we will have to look into that. Uh, that's something that um, I don't think any of us have um, looked into or considered. So uh, that'll definitely be something we'll take under advisement. I think that brings us to our next slide, which is the start of the activated sludge subchapter subchapter F. Um, in this section, we're there are in reading over chapter 217, there are a bunch of uh, issues that I think we are looking to possibly address. Uh, some of the areas that we want to address are the primary clarifier or within the primary clarifiers. 
the aeration basins, the sequencing batch reactors, the membrane bioreactors, and even possibly the volume flux design methodology that's listed in, that's currently listed in 217. Um, I see we have one more question, Nancy. Yes. Seeking clarification, currently there is no recommended way of calculating peaking factor in 217.53 pipe design. So is there one at another section of the rule that should be used? It's done on a case by case. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and well, we, we do that on a case by case basis, depending on what we're looking at. Um, that you're right, there is no uh, recommended way, but uh, we do look at the different situations. Okay. We have one more. Does TCEQ allow pump control elevations to be above incoming flow line elevations? If yes, in which cases? I thought that was the rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing is you can't back up into the lines into somebody's house. Um, the answer to that is yes, we we do we do allow control elevations to be above the incoming flow line. We don't want anything to, like I said before, back up into somebody's houses and I believe 217 does require that their uh, the controls cannot are not supposed to be at the same line as the input line, the same level elevation. Okay. Will there be a cool. recommended peaking factor for mass loadings, VOD, etc.? Um, That's going to clarify that question. Can. Um, can that question be clarified a little bit in terms of exactly what they're what they're looking at asking? Because that could mean a whole lot of different things. We'll wait a moment for it to come in. Yeah. BOD. The peaking, the peaking factor is going to be based on the AG or collection system type of pipe that you have, which are on IM fields. Mm -hmm. that, that's going to be done. You can't do it by rule. Specific for each, for each plant. Right. Yeah. Basically, for each system, on <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, uh, we were just talking a little bit up here about uh, that question and a lot of the rec I don't know if there'll be a recommended peaking factor that'll be applicable across the board. Um, it's more done on a case by case basis because there's a lot of um, interdependencies within different systems that uh, will lead to satisfying what that answer will be. So, yeah, that that is something that it that is proposed as part of the submittal and reviewed during the technical review that we perform. Mm -hmm. So, um, if if more questions come in, we'll we'll address them. But uh, we'll move on to the um, activated sludge section. Like I said, the first thing we're going to tackle is the primary Excuse clarifiers. Me. Yes. Uh, you have the you want the example now. Would you like for it? Yeah, let's let's go. Out with that. OK, an example, a typical mass loading factor of BOD5 is 1.8 based on average daily flow. This is used if no existing data is available. Hmm. Um, that is something that uh, I'm 
one i'm not familiar with with that uh we'll we'll have to review and address that is he talking the question between any of the design flow and annual average flow yeah is this is this a well he's talking that says mass loading factor. yeah not flow this is a bod5 question I never had it put that way me neither Maybe I don't know if you're referring to PA. Uh, we'll, Next month. We're not prepared to actually to put a solid answer to that question, so we'll we'll definitely review and and get back on and and publish a, an answer Ask to that. Send an email to us, and we'll, we'll yes. talk about it. Please send an email to uh, the three of us, if you would, um, Lewis, Paul, and Baltazar. Uh, and we'll we'll definitely address that. It's used, it says it's used to size aeration blowers. Nice. Okay. Okay. So we'll like I said, we'll we'll address that uh, globally to to all attendees and publish uh, publish a uh, an answer. You can do it on the on our internet. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, one of the things that we've been seeing a lot lately is um, weir loading rates and variability of weir loading rates being above the uh, the design standards of twenty thousand or thirty thousand gallons per day per. For, per foot of, of uh, weir. Um, I know I particularly, I specifically had one not too long ago where it was um, considerably higher than what that was. Uh, when we do that, uh, you know, we take into account a lot of different things, uh, different aspects of the treatment plant, like uh, what are these primary clarifiers being used for, what's the sizing, the depth, all of that goes into um, what what we say is uh, the weir loading rate and the possible weir, weir loading rates that we'll allow is um, dependent on. Uh, also, what kind of treatment follows the uh, clarifiers? Uh, and since these are primaries, uh, we don't see a whole lot of primary clarifiers anymore because of the um, the land usage that they take. But uh, given this, what what we're going to do is we're, we'll open up this section and we'll review the numbers that we have and and see and maybe we can put some clarification, no pun intended, uh, in the uh, 217 rule to see if we can increase that number some or how we can how we can handle it and what possibilities there are in, in doing something with it. Uh, we're also going to look at the surface loading criteria for primary clarifiers and the peak flow usage. Um, surface loading, you know, it's going to take into account if there's um, equalization basins and what the what kind of treatment is um, you know, preliminary treatment is occurring, and like it says on the dependent portion, what side, what part of, what type of treatment is going on after the primary clarifier to see how all this is going to work. Next slide, please. For the aeration basins, we'll, we're, we plan on reviewing the loading criteria to see if there is um, anything that we need to change there. We'll, we'll look at uh, to see what is um, that there's no guarantee as to what will change or, or how it will change. Um, definitely some verbiage corrections that I believe we found in 217 uh, that need to be updated. Uh, we've had some questions and requests to uh, allow different uh, piping grades and piping types for aeration piping within the aeration basins. So we'll review those and also the diffuser correction values and factors 
versus the depths that uh, are occurring within the aeration basins. Next slide, please. Uh, this is something that um, we've seen quite a bit of lately in the sequencing batch reactors. Uh, there's a lot of design um, language within 217 that bases uh, design on the average daily flow or design flow, as we like to say, and uh, we're looking at possibly updating it to uh, say that you need to design your reactors on peak daily flow because uh, you know, if you've got the peak coming in, we've got to be able to treat it. And um, I think some of the designs are being designed on the edge and we need to make sure that we're able to handle the, the peak flow. Uh, same with the canter design. It, it, a lot of it in the SBR section, whether it's basin sizing, whether it's peak flow usage or whether it's decanter design, it's all, um, I believe it all says, uh, design values, which is the ADF and not the PDF. So we're going to uh, look into that section mm -hmm. since we're opening up, want to open up the activated sludge and uh, just review to make sure that we're, we're actually looking at the, the right flow that we should. Uh, Nancy, you want to you want to handle that question that we do have? Yes, it's are there are there different volume requirements on aeration for package plants slash interim plants versus the ultimate plant? No, there is no design difference. It's volume requirements. Um, we still design to the standards that are in 217 and the volume comes out based on um, loading. loading. Thank you. OK, um, let's move on to the MBRs, which is the next slide, please. Membrane bioreactors. Um, we have a, a lot of MBRs being built currently and seeing more of them. And one of the issues that we want to look at, it, and specifically is the last one that we have here, which is the flux rates. Uh, the flux rates at the average daily flow versus the flux rates at the PDF flow and the design standards. So we're, we plan on reviewing uh, what's in current AP42 and possibly updating those. Um, also the peak flow usage and the use of uh, equalization basins and the uh, membrane types and technologies to see if um, you know, that'll, depending on what types and technologies we have as to whether uh, flux rates vary based on that instead of like a single design flux rate. The next slide. Um, the volumes, volume flux design method, which is in which is currently in 217. Um, there's, I know Lewis and I were talking a couple, a few, about a month or so ago about possibly taking this out of 217 because there's not but a handful of plants, if that, that, that we've known that have used this. So, there, like I said, there's possible exclusion of this design method from the activated sludge chapter. Um, that, like I said, will depend on the number of plants that are designed or doing it, and we'll seriously look at the merits of maintaining it. Um, you know, it's it is already there, so it may not be worthwhile to remove it, but leave it. And then what, if anything, do we need to change about it? So that is something that we will definitely look at. And we have one question. 
Do you have a feel if reuse is increasing slash expanding in Texas? Very much so. Uh, the reuse of uh, the, the reclaimed water is definitely be increasing and there's more of it. Uh, we're seeing more authorizations come in and definitely a lot more design on plants that are being built new and also ones that are being um, renovated to handle uh, reuse water and produce reclaimed water. So um, I believe we have one more question. I believe you're taught. I believe that question. It says we we use it, and I I will be happy to work with you in reviewing it. I'm assuming you're talking about the volume flux method. Uh, so definitely, well, any any insight that you want to provide, um, we will definitely take. Um, the other next question, does the volume flux method apply to both hollow fiber and plate membranes? No, it's not part no it is not part of the MBR system. It is a separate de separate design method for activated sludge systems. I said the word flux then. Yeah. Okay. Then I have another statement. There are areas that need to be clarified on the volume flux. I definitely agree because I, I, I think I've gone through and reviewed uh, two plants that have designed for them and it is definitely different than the standard activated sludge system method and I agree that the 217 does need to be clarified. So I will definitely be looking out for help to, to work with somebody on this. I think the next slide brings us to a new presenter, which is the advanced nutrient removal, and that will I will turn it over to Baltasar Lucero Ramirez. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone. This is about Sarosor Ramirez, and I'm going to be presenting uh, updating of uh, uh, advanced uh, nutrient removal criteria. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is section 217.163, advanced nutrient removal, and I'm going to be talking about the need of the update and then uh, how do we plan on expanding the requirements. Next slide, please. Well, the need of the update, uh, with more and more plants getting total phosphorus in total nutrient requirements, their permits, we have been asked to update the, this section on advanced nutrient removal. Next slide, please. I'm going to give a little background about the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, total phosphorus uh, limits in the, uh, the permits. Uh, this table shows uh, the typical level limits for total phosphorus uh, uh, established by TCQ. Uh, for instance, we have that um, basically the, uh, the limits uh, in this table, we have the limits based on the permitted flows. For uh, flows below 0.5 NGD, the typical total phosphorus limit is this 1 milligrams per liter. For flows between 0.5 and 3 NGD, the typical limits for total phosphorus is going to be between 0.5 and 1 milligram per liter. And for larger plants, greater than 3, 3 NGD, we're going to see typical total phosphorus limits in the range of 0.5 milligrams per liter. Uh, next slide, please. This is an inventory of permits. 
in the state with uh, nutrient limits as of February uh, 2020. This information was presented by uh, Raj Batarai and co-authors at the Texas Water 2020 conference. And as we can see here, most of the plants on the, uh, the right hand side column, that's the number of permits. On the first column, we have the total phosphorus limit. As we can see, most of the plant, the permits 77 were issued with uh, total phosphorus limits between 0.5 and less than one milligrams per liter. And then uh, we have uh, 37 plants with total phosphor limits between 0.15 and 0 0.5. Just a few plants, few permits with um, with total phosphor limits less than 0 .0 0 0.15, which is which is low. And 32 permits were uh, issued with report only uh, conditions. Regarding total nitrogen limits, we have 14 permits only. Of those, seven were issued with um, uh, not total nitrogen uh, numerical, in numeric limit, and seven uh, were issued with report only conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Regarding, uh, we have plans on expanding the requirements uh, uh, in this section. We're going to be looking basically into uh, sizing requirements. We're going to be looking into uh, uh, dissolved oxygen limits. Uh, also, okay. we have plans. Uh, we plan on uh, reviewing the chemical requirements, uh, specifically for phosphorus yeah. removal mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, other requirements. Next slide, Baltazar. please. Baltazar, yes? you have one question. Okay. Will you require existing permits to meet nutrient removal during the permit renewal? Maybe. Uh, maybe, yes, that's that's a possibility. Depending on location, location, location. That's going to be depending on the location uh, of the project. Uh, okay. There are some sensi uh, sensitivity water bod bodies in the state where we definitely will be looking into that. Correct. We have another and it says, is there a time frame for implementation of nutrient limits. My understanding is that nutrient limits are based on requirement of receiving stream. If you get a nutrient limits, you get a three year compliance period. Well, uh, if, if the uh, permittee uh, gets uh, Nutrient limits, I believe it's going to be three years. Three year compliance period. A three year compliance period. Yeah, and yes, it's based on nutrient, I mean, receiving stream. And uh, yeah, we confirmed that that's based on, on the uh, receiving stream. Okay, uh, next we're going to, I'm going <coughs> to talk about the um, biological phosphorus removal. Uh, here we want to identify the common process configurations, uh, the technologies, the common technologies that are being used. And based on that, we are going to, uh, we plan on establishing process design requirements. We're going to look into the influent wastewater characteristics like ratios. Uh, and then we're going to, we're going to try to establish uh sizing requirements for the anaerobic zone the aerobic zone and the uh as well as the aeration system uh, we're going to be looking also into the operational factors and probably uh, some process control and the chemical addition requirements next slide please regarding biological nutrient removal is a similar process we're going to identify the common process configurations, and then we're going to try to establish um, process design requirements. We're going to look into the influent wastewater characteristics, uh, SRT, uh, the O concentration range. We're going to look into a specific denitrification rates and, and uh, mixed liquid benzolis concentration, alkalinity, temperature, and mixing requirements, and uh, internal recycle and RAS recycle ratios. 
think this is. Uh, we got a couple of questions. Have I have a couple of questions to come up yes. for you. Yes, it please. says, um, please clarify whether you plan to start including nutrient limits on permit renewals. And it says, please clarify whether you plan to start imposing nutrient limits on permit renewals. The answer to that is maybe. It's depending on the location, uh, what is happening at the uh, permit site. It's not a blanket where we're going to put nutrients on everybody, but it's, uh, yes, you can get it in your renewal, and it's depending on what's happening on the receiving stream. So the answer is it can happen on a renewal. You're not grandfathered because your limits can change down the road. So you may have a 2020 permit today based on the receiving stream. In the future, you may have a 5-5, and you may have a total phosphorus or total nitrogen depending on uh, that receiving stream, but it's based on receiving stream and what's happening in that watershed. Okay. Will you include anoxic zone design? Yes, we will. We will try to include anoxic zone design requirements. And nutrient removal plants are most commonly designed using process models. Any thoughts on rules on how these are used? We'll look into it. We're going to be looking into this and um, we welcome definitely inputs from from stakeholders. I guess there is one more question. Um, are, OK, are the process models TCEQs use or recommend to use? Well, is there any process models that you recommend to use? No. We don't have uh, process models that we can recommend at this point. Uh, we're going to uh, be looking into that uh, to see what um, was probably the most common uh, commercial uh, process models. That's something that we are looking into that, definitely. Thank you. That concludes my presentation. Uh, next, we are going to, Paul is going to talk about the natural treatment systems. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. For natural treatment systems, um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, there, there is this essentially one change that we definitely have to make to 217, and is and that is to align section 217.203 to agree with uh, current um, rule um, Texas Administrative Code 30 TAC 30913D, which requires for a, in the impoundments overlying recharge zones of either major or minor aquifers that the soil liner be of three foot thickness and with a required uh, 10 to the minus seven permeability. Um, if you use synthetic liners, it'll have to be 40 mil. Um, that is something that uh, we are we are working with currently uh, in making those changes, but uh, we definitely want to make sure that 217.203 and 309.13d do agree with each other. Other changes that we'd make to 217.203 would be to remove any ambiguities and then just other updates as needed to, as determined during the review of 217.203. Um, Four questions for. Yeah, we have a couple questions. Uh, more questions on the nutrient removal. One of the questions will be: Will you include criteria for biological removal only, uh, chemical removal only, and combined processes? Yeah. The answer to that is yes. We 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 will definitely review and and come up with. Um, probably standards for all of it. 
Um, and then the, the second, quest, uh, second question was, um, why does TCEQ not have TN requirements and only NH3 requirements? They are added in certain areas. And as Lewis just mentioned, the reason for that is uh, that it depends on the area that you're in. Like he said before, location, location. Some of the, some of the areas are TN and others are NH3. So uh, that is the reason for that. Uh, but there is a good possibility that TN will be increasing. Especially in lakes. And around the, the lakes area, especially. Um, the last question we have on that, uh, will the line, okay, this goes to the natural treatment system. Uh, will the liner change also apply to effluent holding ponds following treatment? And the answer is yes, it will. You have one more. Um, will you include criteria for biological removal only? Oh, no, you have that one. Sorry. Yeah, we, yeah. Okay, got that one. So, um, well, now we, we do have some more. Uh, okay, uh, nutrient removal plants are most commonly designed. Oh, this is just a thank you of a follow up. Okay. We've answered it. Thanks. Right. Okay. Um, I think this now brings us up to Lewis. No, that was our. Oh, disinfection. <clears throat> Thank you both. We're going to talk now about updating disinfection requirements, specifically subchapters K for uh, chlorine disinfection and subchapter L for UV light disinfection. Um, Thanks. We're going to, in addition to chlorine and uh, ultraviolet, we're going to be looking into other disinfection methods. Uh, for instance, uh, parasitic acid, uh, proliformic acid. Uh, that's what we're planning on, on, on doing regarding disinfection. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, uh, subchapter K, chlorine uh, disinfection, we're going to be looking into updating the requirements for gaseous chlorine and for sodium hypochlorite. Uh, for sodium hypochlorite, most probably we're going to include those uh, requirements or criteria for on-site generation of bleach. Next slide, please. Regarding UV disinfection, uh, we're going to update the rules and we're going to be looking also into requirements that appear to be too stringent. Uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a look at the redundancy redundancy requirements, and also we will look into uh, regrowth issues. Uh, we have uh, we have heard about some regrowth issues in some uh, regions, and we, we we want to look into that also. And with that, that brings us to subsurface and on-site disposal. Okay. That's in the well, chapter, Luis. Yes. Can I you have a couple of questions. They might have been uh, from the yeah. previous. Uh, the first one is, will process modeling be allowed for BNR design? If so, will there be a specific models allowed? It's going to be done on a case by case, but the answer is yes. Um, we'll look at it on an individual basis. OK. Should effluent filters such as disc filters be prior to disinfection or can they be after disinfection? Uh, I don't know why you would put them prior to disinfection because then you're treating, um, you got a lot of solids. You want to do, you, I, I would see it after disinfection so you don't have to worry about uh, the solids. 
Yeah, but the disinfection Clar chlorine, chlorine will chew up the... Yes, yeah, the chlorine may have a problem with it. But the, the thing is, we would have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. So you may want to put some chlorine up front just to keep some of the slime growth off on your filters. But then again, part of that slime growth is part of your filtration mechanism. So it's a, it's a catch-22. So I would say it would be done on a case-by-case -case basis. But for the most part, most people will be doing it after the, your filters, it's not before. Yeah, for compliance requirements, it is uh, it is a requirement that uh, monitoring be uh, done at the uh, at the end of the treatment units. So perhaps perhaps as a process control, we may allow it. We may allow that. Okay. Is there a listing or map available of the recharge zones for major and minor aquifers that are not the Edwards? Uh, yes, uh, you can get that from the Water Development Board. They have a list of showing the, where the recharge zones are for all the major and minor aquifers in the state of Texas. You can go to their website, which is uh, TDWB. TWDB. TWDB. Texas.gov. Texas.gov. Okay. We have another comment on UV systems don't disinfect well if TSS is present. Filters need to be upstream of UV. That's basically what we just said. Yeah. So you're in agreement? Yes. But you may want to disinfect upstream if you, you get a lot of slime growth on your filters uh, to reduce some of that. Thank you. Thank you. And just to let you all know that uh, Paul, myself and Beltas are in the same room, but we are practicing social distancing and we are wearing masks, except when we're talking. So in case any of y'all were wondering, we are following the rules. Uh, I'm going to be talking about something that was supposed to be put in the design criteria back in 2008, but due to time constraints of another rule package that uh, we had to get out, uh, it was put in Chapter 222, which is the subsurface drip irrigation system. Um, and uh, uh, first, go ahead and answer the question, Nancy, and then I'll talk about Chapter 222. Any requirements for plants to be hydrologically capable of pushing treated effluent out during 500 year flood events? Uh, we're starting to see this question pop up more. The answer is done is going to be on a case by case basis. Uh, the we don't want if, if the plant has got a levee and we got flow coming into it, we want to be able to push that flow out. Uh, I would hate to see that we have a permanent pump that only gets used once in a lifetime. Uh, but the requirement that we'd probably set in place would be something of the neighborhood that uh, you have to be able to put in temporary pumps to make sure you've got the flow coming in so it didn't back up into the plant. And that you're gonna probably have to put a flapper valve on your pipe so we don't have the water flowing back into the plant. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, let's get back to subchapter I. Uh, we had a timeline back in uh, 2006. We had to get the sub subsurface uh, design out, and we had and and because of that, we had to uh, push the stuff that we're working in, in the design criteria uh, for uh, subsurface and for uh, basically small on-site systems. Uh, we moved to Chapter 222, which is this, in a sense subchapter D. We're proposing to put it back in the design criteria where it's supposed to be. As if uh, y'all looked at the design criteria, you notice there's no subchapter I. It's been reserved for this section. And so we're going to be moving that. Uh, we're also going to be looking at other treatment process and disposal methods. Um, one of the things that you have to remember, these are for the subsurface type systems. And 
Uh, most of them are small in magnitude. Some of them are large, but most of them are small in magnitude. And just to let you know, subsurface by federal law over 5,000 are is considered a UIC injection well. So we have to assure whatever we put in into the permit is um, meets those requirements, which means uh, you, you cannot have a large gravity system because you have to show uh, uh, fluid distribution where you're uh, spreading the water equally over the whole site. So uh, chapter 222 right now only talks about subdrip. Uh, but we'll be adding requirements for disposal that would also include uh, pressure dosing systems in which we can get equal distribution of the water throughout the system. Uh, and but the ch what we have to look at is make sure we're going to be uh, in line with both state and federal requirements. The other thing is we're going to be looking at the existing criteria that we have in Chapter 222 uh, to see if there's any updates. One of the things that you need to be aware of, we're not putting in, uh, we're only looking at the design of the systems. Uh, we're not going to be looking at the application rates and stuff like that. That is all going to stay in 222. We're only moving over subchapter D and maybe some other parts of the rules. And we'll probably be opening up 222. Uh, well, we will be opening up 222 and subchapter D uh, to. Uh, uh, basically delete that chapter and move it over and we'll probably have to do some cleanup of the regular chapters to refer back to 217 in the appropriate numbers. Uh, but we'll also be looking at if there's anything else in 222 that needs to be put over under the design criteria. But again, as I'm saying, we are not going to be looking at the application rates. We're not going to be changing the models uh, that's required in the rules or any of that stuff. We're going to be looking at uh, things of the nature of the disposal. Uh, if you're looking at subdrip, uh, the flushing, how to set the flushing velocity, uh, the circling, you know, basically the looping of the systems and that type of thing. So we're going to be updating all those requirements. And this is one of the things that we are proposing to do. And hopefully we can finally get subchapter I and all that system uh, taken care of. Next slide, please. Miscellaneous. This is uh, some of the questions, or well, actually we only have one question really to answer on here. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the things that has been happening over the years, uh, especially the last couple of years, is uh, clarifying the flow measurement requirements for both primary and secondary flow meters. Uh, which ones are required by rules and which ones are not. One of the things it says, if you have a permit that requires total meterization, you have to have a primary and a secondary meter. A primary meter is like a partial flume, a V-notch weir or something of that nature, something that is not mechanical in which somebody can go physically measure. And a secondary meter is a totalizing type of meter. So, and if you have a secondary meter, you have to have a primary meter uh, to show that you're within calibration, that your meter's within 10%. Even though all secondary meters are supposed to be calibrated and certified once every year, this is a check that the region does to make sure when they go out there and, and see if they're within there. The other thing that uh, has been coming up and has been causing some people heartache is if they have other meters within the system, one of the things that we are looking at putting in the design criteria is uh, if it's internal uh, monitoring meters in which you all are using for uh, plant operation and it's not for reporting or for any of the other requirements, uh, we're going to say those meters are not subject to 217 and they're internally, so they're not required uh, to have primary and secondary uh, requirements on them. So what we're looking at clarifying it so there is no questions in the future. OK. Uh, Nancy, I think we have another question. OK. Will TCEQ require electrical components and other important equipment to be above 500 year? 
instead of existing 100 year for locations such as Houston, Corpus, others susceptible to hurricane flooding? That is one of the things that we're going to be looking at. One of the things that we learned from Ike and uh, some other storms is we're going to have to, uh, and it, it's not so much in the design, it is more in uh, looking at how to maintain and what we have to do. We had some plants that they saw they're getting ready to be flooded, so they shut down all their electrical system. We had other plants that didn't do that and basically let it short out everything. So we will, uh, uh, the requirement, I mean, the, the answer, the short answer is it's going to be done on a case by case basis. And the rule is still going to stay 100 years. We're not going to say 500 years. Uh, but, uh, that may change in the future, but right now I, I don't see it's changing to the 500 year standard right now. I think we're still seeing the 100 year standard. Okay. Next, WAS measurement is required for, I believe, 0 0.4 MGD flows, but most plants don't seem to have these. Huh? Uh, uh, I agree. Most plants don't. A lot of the larger plants do have them. Uh, like I said, if it's a meter, it's not required in the rules, uh, and you're only using it for your process controls, it's not going to be part of the deal. Uh, we'll look at, I'll go back and look at the 0 0.4, 0 .4, uh, 0 0.4 MGD to see if that's because I don't remember exactly what that rule says right now offhand. Okay. Is influent meters required for new construction? It depends. Uh, we do recommend that you have an, uh, at least a primary influent pro meter, flow, pardon me, flow meter. Okay. Any other update to floodplain requirements, either site access during 25 year storm for lift station or protection from 100 year storm? Uh, we will look at it, but uh, as of right now, we're not proposing any changes. If you have questions and you think we should be updating it, uh, please submit that by the January 15th date. Any updates to equalization basin requirements, screening, DO, mixing, et cetera? Uh, they're all subject to being looked at. Right now, it's not uh, things on our radar. Right now, we're putting stuff that we have on our radar, but any of these things can be updated. When we open up the rules, um, and uh, we can uh, open up the rules and make any changes, but the problem is we have to, when we write our memo uh, and tell the commissioners what we're proposing to change, that is when we're kind of stuck on, uh, we can't add anything after that. Okay. Is there a waiver available for access road to be above the 100 year floodplain if adjacent highways are underwater during 100 year flood? The answer to that question is we look at it on a case by case basis. And the uh, thing is, can you get to the plant? If you can get to the plant by boat and you're in the backwater, we don't want you to go into the flood water. Um, yes, you can get a waiver, but we look at it on a case by case basis. We want to make sure everybody is safe. We're not going to put it. We don't want anybody to be in harm's way. Okay, here's a question. Will you have a copy of the slide presentation on the TCQ website and or email participants? And the answer to that I can answer is yes. We currently have it on the design criteria stakeholder group and um, we will be transcribing the meeting summary and that will be posted and you'll also have a link for the video on YouTube. Next question. FYI, in Florida, insurance companies have been requiring electrical equipment elevations that are more conservative than those of the regulatory agency. Is this worth checking them with them? Uh, that's that's going to be on who you insure with. The thing is, 
like if you're in Galveston and uh, if you go out on the beach and see they have two lift stations on the uh, east end, you wouldn't even know they're lift stations because their electrical panels and all that is one is in a windmill and the electrical panels are all above the uh, height way up there. The only thing's going to get them is if we have a storm surge and we have high waves. And uh, so the answer is we want, if, we, if it's in an area that it's going to be prone to flooding, we want these things protected. Uh, but, you know, we're going to set minimum, remember, we set minimum requirements. You can always go up and beyond that. And I do recommend people to go beyond the minimum requirements for, uh, uh, for anything that we put in here. And remember, this is a uh, draft design criteria. I mean, this is a design criteria. It's not an operation. This is just a guide book uh, to help you get to designing your plants. We set minimums. We and we do set some ranges sometimes, but for the most part, we set minimums. So uh, you need to look at each individual case for uh what you're doing okay the next one it just states it is 0 0.4 mgd refer to 217.159 process control so someone look that up to i'm confirm. looking it up it's uh 217.159 page 155 Lewis. 155 that's oh that's uh Yeah, it basically says on large plants, you have to provide a totalizing meter and uh, that'd be one of the required meters in the rule. I'm just saying if there is no requirement in the rules for meters, uh, then you're up to what you have to. That one is required um, for WASP and WASP okay. for your waste and your um, return activated sludge. You have another one. Uh, clarification required for sludge holding tank mixing requirement for aerobically digested sludge. The code requires mixing. Which cases allow TCEQ to make a variance on this requirement? Refer to 217.251. Okay. Oh, two five months. I gotta get the sludge. Two five one. Yeah. Sludge storage. It says sludge holding tank mixing requirement. Two five one is sludge storage, biome, aerobic digester. Stockpile, dewatering, dry sludge storage. Are we got the number right? Well, it says sludge holding tank mixing requirement for aerobically digested sludge. So it would be under the digested sludge. Right, I'm reading it. Capacity for mixing of 30. Okay, 30 cubic standard. Yeah. Okay, the question is. Which cases uh, allow TC to make a variance on this requirement? Uh, if you got a better way of mixing it and you can ask for a variance, there's no problem. We grant variances all over. The uh, uh, the only thing that we cannot grant a variance to in the rules, this is for everybody's purpose, is if it's a prohibition in the rules, the staff cannot grant a variance to a prohibition. There's only, I think, 13 or 14 prohibitions in the rules, and most of them are set up for safety or for uh, other means that uh, we cannot fix something. But uh, 
you can grant we'll grant you a variance providing there's no health and safety uh, concerns with that variance and that we do have that as I tell people that warm and fuzzy that uh, the variance that you're looking at will work. So all you have to do is justify the variance and we will uh, look at it on a case by case basis. Okay. Is there considerations given to grit system redundancy for aerobically digested sludge wastewater treatment plants? We're hoping that we you have a grit removal up front so we don't have enough a lot of grit in your aerobic digesters because all that grit does is tear up your digesters. But consideration given to grit systems redundancy, uh, we kind of look at it as uh, as much as possible. Okay. It mentions 217.251 D1. Right, and uh, that's what we were looking at on the dewatering. Okay. On the previous question. Uh, so we're basically into uh, the last slide or next to the last slide. Which is um, the wrap up. And question and answers uh, now as if you have any questions that you want, you want us to talk about something else that's not in the rules. Fine. But one of the things that I want to make sure that it, everybody goes away from with today is we are looking at it. We're proposing to open up the rules to make clarifications. Uh, when I rewrote the design criteria and had it adopted in 2008, I had it with the idea that we'll be looking at updating it every five years. And the way technology has been changing, if you kind of look at things over the last uh, several years, we're seeing different plants. We're seeing uh, different loading rates. Uh, we're seeing a, a lot of different things. Standards are getting much tighter, so we need to keep this criteria up to date and we cannot sit on it. We have new criteria coming down the line. And that being said, we, uh, we, we're, we want your comments. Uh, we want you to submit proposed languages to us, uh, but we need to set a cutoff date of January 15th. Uh, so we can keep somewhat on our timeline and we have something uh, to work on during the next several months uh, working on this thing. As I said before, on certain things that we will probably have uh, individual stakeholder meetings or uh, for like when we're talking with MBRs, making some changes to the flux rates. Uh, we're looking at UV systems. We may be looking at uh, having uh, setting up for their input and, and, and like I said all these meetings are open you're well to participate uh, uh, most likely these meetings are not going to be set up so much as a live event where's question I mean it'd be an open forum type thing we're just limited we can't do that right now it's because uh, the size of the amount of people that were invited we had we invited over 2,000 people to this meeting so that's what we're looking at right now uh, it's, uh, we do have a new question. Is grit removal systems a mandatory process in uh, wastewater treatment plants? The answer is it's not mandatory, but it's highly, highly recommended. Okay. You have another question. And the other question is this revision. Are you looking at uh, comparing with other state rules, EPA's 10 state standards? Uh, there is no way we would look at 10 state standards because our climate is totally different. The 10 state standards are based around the Great Lakes. It's cold weather. We have hot weather. And some of the things that we have to consider, we have people coming down here all the time that has processes uh, that are on the fixed film reactors uh, that are designed for 60 degree uh, influence. And just to let you know, in some of the places, some of these cities in Texas, we have water coming into the wastewater treatment plant at 100 degrees. So we do not look at st uh, 10 state standards. We do look at the overall process, but we have to also look at things in this area where uh, uh, majority of the water coming into wastewater treatment plants for the most part are somewhere in the 80 to 90 degree weather in the summertime. 
So we have to look at, we have hot water versus when you look at 10 state standards, it's cold water type things. And uh, those numbers don't quite work down here. Okay. Anything in the planning phase to look at total dissolved solids, chlorides or sulfate, which are showing up in permits? Uh, as of right now, we're looking at that on a case by case basis. OK, this is just a statement. Ten state standards are not good. And they're very old and do not uh, address the nutrients. Recommend using WEF manuals of practice instead. Yeah. Right, and the thing is, we when we look at things, just to let people know, we are looking at things uh, from uh, Metcalf and Eddie. We do look at West uh, standards and we do look at uh, changing some of the temperature requirements and we do look at stuff like that but we also look at what is actually happening uh, some of the things as I said uh, the models will show one thing but things don't always uh, come out the way the models are showing will there be imposed limits for uh, TDS uh, that is a permitting question. Uh, if they become a permitting question, then we'll have to look at it during the permit. I mean, during if it becomes a permit limit, then we'll have to look at it during uh, the design phase. But as of right now, that is not a standard limit that uh, we're going to take a look at. Will there be a schedule posted for future meetings? It is very difficult to schedule for this important meeting on short notice. Uh, well, just to let you know, the first notice went out last month uh, and I sent out the second notice earlier this week, but the first notice had the date and time and I just sent the notice that went out this week to a lot of people and it got mailed out a couple of times because people didn't have it or they showed up their spam, but we did. Uh, we did send out a notice a month ago uh, holding uh, November 19th at, at 1.30 as a, uh, a date that we we're going to have this. The answer is in the future we will set it up and if you want to participate in any one section we'll notify you as soon as we know about it. Uh, I'm sorry that some people got late notices on there but we are uh, uh, we're going to be working with a real tight timeline but yes We'll try to give you as much notice as possible uh, for the meetings in the future, and they will be all posted as soon as we set dates. Will be posted on our uh, website. Okay. Will TDS effluent criteria be based on background drinking water? I have no idea. That is a permanent question. Is there a list of Texas average wastewater temps, wastewater loadings, air temp ranges for design purposes? I don't know if there is a, a formal list, but the answer to, to the thing is I use basically just uh, when I talk to salesmen coming in, I look at my, uh, my two uh, the by two extreme cases in which I use city of Laredo because usually their water is the hottest on the average coming in. They have a shallow collection system and they have in their they average 100 degrees for 100 days in the summertime. And the coldest temperatures that we have information for is the city of Amarillo. So those are the two extremes. When I look at people and I talk about different processes coming into the state, those are what I use. Okay. TCEQ thoughts on PFAs, future of technology and effluent criteria? Uh, we are, the agency as a whole is looking at this system right now. Um, and because we're looking at it in sludge, we're looking at it on several different things. We're not going to be addressing it in this design criteria because the agency is not far enough along uh, to do anything about it, but that will be something that will, I suspect, will happen in the future. 
Any 217 related changes to chapter 321 subchapter P? Uh, we're not proposing anything right now. If you want to make changes, uh, you submit it, but we're not proposing to open up chapter 321 P. Okay. Will you be looking at design flows and effluent wastewater characteristics knowing based on flow trends? Flows tend to be much lower and effluent loadings are much higher than in the past. That is one of the things that when we open up these rules, we are going to be looking at. Uh, as when I was in school back in the Stone Ages, uh, my professor basically said, uh, you never have uh, for a domestic plant, unless they have a lot of industry on it, you never have to look at the organic flow. It's always going to be the uh, limiting factor. Uh, that is not the case anymore. We now have plants that are organically overloaded and hydraulically underloaded. Uh, then you go look at in the last several years with the flow reductions, uh, the tighter collection systems and stuff of this nature, we're seeing ammonias. When I first started the agencies, I tell people uh, it was you normally see the ammonias coming into a wastewater treatment plant somewhere in the ranges of 12. Now we're seeing in some plants that we're seeing the ammonias uh, uh, as high as 70 coming into a wastewater treatment plant. And the other thing is, you know, we used to design on a 200 BOD coming into the plant, and we got plants now that have BOD coming in that are basically bedroom communities as high as uh, in the high 400 to 500 range. So, uh, and that's all coming down because of uh, tighter collection systems and uh, water saving devices. And then you got, then the other things that are coming down the pipe, uh, we got developers that are designing some of the subdivisions, which every home is now gonna have a great water system. So, uh, we have other problems that we're going to have to be looking at in the future on uh, we're not going to have that as I call it the push water to push the solids down the line. So uh, if everybody starts using gray water systems, we lose 60 to 70 percent of the, the push water. So the concentrations going into the wastewater treatment plant can be very high and we'll probably have to start uh, looking at going back to the the early 20s and the teens, 19, uh, the 19 teens, not the 20 teens, uh, basically uh, putting in flush manholes again. And that's something I really don't want to see, but that may be something that we have to do to keep the, the flow moving in the thing. Okay. You had a question again. What prompted this revision? Uh, technology and uh, we have a lot of stuff this happening right now. Uh, you know, if we don't do something, uh, we're going to see more variances and we have, you're, you're seeing tighter limits on wastewater treatment plants. You're seeing a lot of uh, different things happening. So uh, the technology is changing and we have to keep up with the technology. If not, this criteria is going to be out of date very soon. Okay. Are there any considerations for special treatment criteria for wastewater plants that may become a building block for a potable reuse project? An example of this would be incorporating membrane integrity testing requirements for an MBR system that could provide additional LRV credit. Uh, yeah, uh, that is actually happening right now. We're looking at um uh, uh things of that nature we got the city of el paso looking at that uh basically we're going we're i would suspect somewhere in the very near future we're going to see more plants in which the wastewater is going to go to a water treatment plant so we're going to have more direct potable reuse right now for the most part we have a lot of indirect potable reuse we do have one, we had one plant that was doing direct potable reuse, but uh, we have, and they are now going indirect. Uh, but uh, we do have one plant that's being designed right now in the state that is doing potable, uh, that is proposed to do potable reuse in the future. 
and it's being built as we talk and it's being going through uh, most of the drinking water side for the filter integrity and stuff of that nature. Uh, uh, I got a question about going to the timeline. We have our kickoff meeting right now. Comments and proposed changes to the language. And if you have changes that you want, please submit those to the language that you want to use and we will consider all that. And that's due on the 15th of January. Uh, so you, you basically got a month, almost two months uh, to get it into us. I know we have the holidays, but we're proposing a very tight timeline based on the information that we get. Uh, Paul, myself and Belisar is going to sit down, figure out what we can do, what we can't do within our timeline and propose uh, the changes to uh, get permission to start the revisions. Uh, then we're going to start the revisions, have stakeholder meetings, and we're looking at having that through March through June. Uh, we're going to look at drafting the rules and doing the fiscal note in July. Uh, drafting uh, uh, the rules for permission to publish, getting to the commission in August. Uh, have a public hearing probably in October on the rules and adoption sometime in March of 2022. This is a very tight timeline. It's probably going to change. Uh, this is not in stone. Uh, because, uh, as I said, because of COVID, uh, where this agency is still working from home and, uh, it, and I don't know when we're going to be able to get back in. So uh, some of the pro things we're going to be slowing down on how we have to handle things, but that is what we're looking at. Okay, you have a few questions. Any specific guidance that might be provided for how to calculate storage volume requirements for a flow equalization tank, e.g. frequency, storm, and duration? Uh, we can provide you some guidelines, some general rules of thumb, but that's got to be done on a case by case and it's got to be based on the unit hydrographs that you have for that city uh, because you know, I can't tell you you have to have a 24 hour storage and it's got to be done on a you know, site by site type of requirement. So, uh, you know, uh, the thing is we can look at it, but we're not going to tell you exactly how to do it because it's got to be done on each individual thing and uh, your models are going to be set up for that. We can give you some general guidelines, but that is, uh, that's basically all we can do for you. I don't want to set that up as a, a, a rule because it, it's not going to work in all situations. Okay. Any additions for high rate clarification requirements for peak flow treatments such as active flow, parentheses VEOLIA? Uh, one of the things that we will probably be looking at, Paul didn't bring this up, but we will probably uh, high rate clarifiers. We may uh, look at the requirements. The other thing is that we may look, be looking at some DAF units too in the future and the rules. We haven't decided if we're going to do that yet or not. I'm hoping that somebody will submit some comments and some uh, proposed language for that. OK. Will you please go back to the slide showing the number of plants in the state with total nitrogen limits? Uh, that's, yeah, that results. slide basically shows as of right now, 14 or seven plants yes. have a total nitrogen limit and seven have a report only. Uh, the next slide on there. There you go. Uh, there's not that many and most of the ones that we have right now are on the coast. They're in the areas of seagrass and they're worrying about uh, algae uh, affecting the seagrass. But we will see some of them in the future. Uh, as we suspect that we will see some with total nitrogen limits, and especially some of the coves and the lake coves. Uh, if we start to have algae blooms and stuff of that nature, that's where you're going to be seeing them. 
Okay, can you briefly go over chapter 309 and its intent? Chapter 309 is, uh, are we, what chapter are you looking at in 309? 309 has irrigation, it has siting requirements, so I'm not sure what you're talking about. And 309, 309 is, uh, has several things part of it in 309. Okay, let's see. Uh, is there a lag on questions that get turned in? Oh. There's just, uh, I was answering that privately, but the, there, people are experiencing lag time between the questions and, but uh, unfortunately that's just part of the design of the teams, the format that we have to use. Yeah, there is a, depending on the number of people online, uh, the lag is uh, based on that. So there could be up to a couple of minute lag between the uh, time the questions are, and I respond back to you. But then again, like I said, uh, we are going to be working on the design criteria. Uh, we're going to be updating the sections that we need. Technologies keeps changing. That's why we're going to be looking at it. Uh, and if there's new technology, we're going to try to keep it incorporated. So after I retire and I pass the baton to Baldassar and uh, Paul, uh, y'all get to holler at them in the future. And just to let you know, uh, this uh, webinar will be posted in the very near future, in the next couple of days. I would assume sometime next week, uh, you'll get a deal. And it will also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Carissa, you can wave your head right if I'm right. It will have a transcript uh, from everything that we said, correct? <laughs> I would say yes, but you remember next week is a short week, uh, Thanksgiving holiday, so it might be bumped to the first week in December, right? right. Well, yes, and once it's uploaded to YouTube, uh, YouTube has a capability of captions um, and the meeting summary will be available on our website. Okay. One last question. We have some permits with TDS limits but there is no practical treatment for TDS. Uh, we have some permits with TDS limitation. I'm not aware of how we could practically treat for TDS if we ex exceed. Do you? Uh, no. Okay, and the anonymous regarding 309 is the beneficial reads credits. Uh, there is going to be nothing in Chapter 217 that will be addressing that. That is, uh, that is something that Ferocious Team is going to be looking at under the permitting process. So I don't have a comment on the 309 for uh, the beneficial reuse credit. I know what the rule says, but uh, I'm not sure how they're going to implement it. The next question is, how do we get added to the distribution list for announcements related to this effort? Uh, uh, everybody who logged on today uh, will be added to the list. Uh, I think some of the people who didn't get uh, earlier notices went to some people's spam. So uh, we shall see. but. I think if you uh, if you logged in and you you registered uh, after you logged into the system, uh, you will be on the list for future notifications. And Carissa could be hopefully verifying saying that is yes. Yes, you can always send a um, an email to outreach email to outreach at tcq.texas.gov with any questions or if we can help you, if you need, want to be add someone else to the distribution list. Right. And just to let you know, uh, all these meetings are open. Uh, 
if we send you notifications with the login information, you can share that with anybody you want. Uh, if some of these smaller ones that we have in the future, uh, where we're going to open it up for discussions, we will be limited to the number of people that can be participate in those type of uh, logins. This one here is set up as a live event, and uh, unfortunately, the only way we can do things are by uh, the way it's set up right now. And Nancy, you're you're out there showing everybody. Really? Yeah. Okay, you got a question. I recently moved to Texas and was asked to review a 90% design. I had several questions regarding the regs. The updates are spot on. Good job, TCQ folks. Oh, so, okay. Compliment. We appreciate your efforts for this presentation. Looking forward to the future discussions. TCQ, could you hold one moment, please? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Uh, the next meeting uh, has not been scheduled yet, but it's going to be sometime after, uh, uh, probably sometime in February. And we'll send out notices. Right. But the thing is, until we get uh, people's comments, uh, and start putting things together. Like I said, we have to, after we decide on what we want to work on, uh, we have to write a memo and get permission from the commissions to proceed. And uh, we're limited to what we put in that memo. So basically I'm saying the uh, January 15th is the cutoff date for us to, uh, to do it. OK, I have, I have no more questions on this end. If that's the case, then we are wrapping up. Y'all got to listen to us for uh, almost two hours. And, then I, and my hat's off to y'all for putting up with listening to us that long. OK, thank you. OK, anything else? Otherwise, uh, the session is ended. And like I said, this thing will hopefully be posted to our website next week. Oh, did you show the last slide uh, that has our contact information and the website? We're working on it. Uh, if y'all have any questions, feel free to contact uh, Paul, uh, myself, or Beldasar, and uh, and our stakeholder website is right there. So we will be posting things right there. So uh, I hope we answered your questions. I hope we confused you. I hope we answered, uh, gave you some ideas. Uh, but uh, we are we are trying to proceed and we want <coughs> to keep our rules up to date. And just to let you know on that one question, other people look at our rules in other states uh because uh our rules are better than some of the other states that got their rules set up so other people copy a lot of our rules designs yeah we want to be the leaders we don't want to be we want to be the chiefs not the indians we want to be the leaders not the followers we want to be pro i'm trying to be proactive you know you got the Aggies right here. We're, we're really going for it. So the answer is bye. And uh, the session is over with. Thank you. <laughs>